Hi, I'm Laura Duval. I'm a 2020 Beckman Young investigator, and I'm really excited to share with you some of the work that we're doing in my lab at Columbia. So we're really interested in understanding peptide signals that enforce paternity in mosquitoes. So we're studying mosquito mating behavior, and this is what it looks like in action. So mosquito mating is very rapid. It can take place in less than 10 seconds, and it often takes place in flight, which is what you're seeing here. So there are three animals in this picture, and we're gonna start with the female. So most of the time when I'm talking about mosquitoes, I end up devoting most of my screen time to the females because they're the ones who actually find and bite humans um, in order to get protein from our blood to develop and lay eggs. And during this interaction where she's actually biting us, this is actually when she spreads the pathogens that lead to these mosquito-borne diseases like Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, and Yellow Fever. Now she's mating with male number one, who's underneath her here. So they're kind of facing away from us and you can see that their genitals are touching. So he's managed to find her in flight um, and copulate with her. There's also a second male who's kind of waiting in the wings here. And one thing that's important to know about mating in this species of mosquitoes is that these females are generally monandrous. What that means is that a single mating event with a single male is sufficient to provision this female with all of the reproductive material that she will use for the rest of her life. What this means kind of in terms of this picture is that male number two has really missed out here. He will never father any of the offspring produced by this female because after she has successfully mated with male number one here, she will reject all future suitors for the rest of her life. Now we know that during mating, males are transferring active signals. So he's transferring not only the sperm that she'll use to fertilize those eggs, but other signals, including neuropeptides that change the female's physiology and behavior. As a postdoc, I identified a male derived peptide called HP1 that activates a receptor in the females called NPY like receptor one that enforces the male's paternity, but only kind of in the short term. So we know that those effects wear off after about a day. And so this means that there are also other as yet unidentified signals that are required for this long-term paternity enforcement. Because remember that this is a change that's going to last for the rest of the female's life. Now, one of the ways that we are interested in studying paternity enforcement is actually to take a look at what happens when it goes wrong, when it's happening inappropriately. And so here we're looking at this form of reproductive interference that's called satirization. It gets its name from these Greek satyrs, known basically for trying to mate indiscriminately with everybody. But in this case, the satyr male is an 80s albopictus male. This is a different species of mosquito. And the nymph here is an 80s Egypti female. So this reproductive interference occurs when the albopictus male tries to inappropriately mate with the Egypti female. Now he can inseminate her, but this pairing does not produce viable offspring. The female will lay non-viable eggs that never hatch for the rest of her life. But because these albopictus males can inappropriately enforce their quote unquote paternity, this female has been effectively sterilized because she will now reject all future suitors, including those of the correct species for the rest of her life. Now, I described to you this male derived HP1 peptide in Aedes aegypti. Aedes albopictus have their own version of the same system. So in both cases, um, the males make these HP1 peptides. Aedes albopictus actually makes two versions of the peptide. And in vitro, these peptides are capable of activating cognate receptors in the female of their same species. But one really interesting finding that we made was that these albopictus derived peptides can crosstalk to the Egypti receptor. So these are studies that were done in vitro, but it's a really kind of intriguing mechanism for how satirization may work. So those albopictus male peptides may be biologically active in Egypti females. But I also told you that we know that HP1 is not the whole story because we know that there must be longer um, peptides that have longer effects that are transferred during mating as well. So one of the first questions that we wanted to ask in my lab is, what's a catalog? What, are, what is the list of all of the peptides that males actually transfer to females during mating? And so to answer these questions, we're taking a proteomics approach. So what we do is we feed heavy labeled yeast to our mosquito larvae and pupae so that you end up with heavy labeled adults. 
we take our labeled Aedes albopictus males and allow them to inseminate unlabeled Egypti females. We then collect the reproductive tract tissue from those females and perform shotgun proteomics to identify all of the heavy labeled peptides because we know those peptides must have been transferred to her from the albopictus male. So those peptides give us a list of potential ligands. So those are the paternity enforcement signals coming from the male. And we use in vitro assays to understand what the receptors are in the female that might be receiving those signals. So here we express mosquito neuropeptide receptors in HEK cells and hook them up to GCAMP as a readout of receptor activation. And so what we can do is we can test these different peptides and pair them with cognate receptors. So the receptors that are activated by those male-derived peptides are likely to regulate female mating behavior. And they're also likely to provide a good entry point to label the cells that are involved in female mating circuitry. Now we know that satirization does occur in the wild. This is a figure that I've taken from a paper from Phil Lunibos's lab. And this is actually a map of all of these tire shops and cemeteries in the state of Florida, where they would go and collect their mosquito larval samples. And so you can see that there are places here in Northern Florida where they find exclusively Aedes albopictus, places in Southern Florida, so Miami, where they find exclusively Aedes aegypti, and parts of Central Florida where they find both species cohabitating. Now they've been studying this for quite a while. And one of the things that they've found is that um, over time, Aedes aegypti females develop resistance to satirization in these regions of cohabitation. So they would find Egypti females who had been inseminated by albopictus males in these regions of cohabitation. But over time, you can see that the Egypti really kind of start making a comeback. And now if you take females from places like Kissimmee and St. Cloud, these females are able to, um, despite exposure to an albopictus male, are still able to mate with an appropriate male and produce viable offspring. So although we don't yet know the mechanism by which these females gain resistance to satirization, this is something that we're in really interested in studying in my lab. And so we now have our own field collected strains that have different cohabitation histories. We have animals, again, from some regions where you find only one species or only the other species. So we often call these our naive populations. And we also have samples here from Los Angeles um, where both species are found in the same place where they cohabitate. And so we predict that females from regions of cohabitation should be more satirization resistant compared to the naive females. And our hypothesis is that females may become resistant to satirization in these regions because they're selected for if they have receptor variants that are less sensitive to those male derived peptides. These are females that can basically ignore those paternity enforcement signals from the albopictus males. And so what we would predict is that females from our naive populations who have never actually encountered an albopictus male in the wild, um, if we take them into the lab and we expose them to albopictus males, they will be very sensitive to satirization. So this means that a female who has encountered an albopictus male, if she subsequently encounters a male of her own species, she will not mate with him because she will have been effectively sterilized and she will produce no offspring. And we also predict that females from cohabiting populations like our Los Angeles strain should have satirization resistance so that an albopictus male will be unable to reproductively interfere with this female and that even after exposure to an albopictus male, she will still be able to mate with a male of the right species and produce viable offspring. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of preliminary data that we've collected. I do wanna highlight that these are pretty early days, um, but I think that the findings are pretty exciting. Um, so what we're quantifying here on the y-axis is the proportion of females who are capable of producing viable offspring. Now, we always normalize these experiments to a set of females who never saw an albopictus male. So the thing to kind of pay attention to in this graph is that the closer these points are to this line at 1.0, um, the smaller the effect the albopictus male had on the female's um, fertility. So the more resistant she was to satirization. And so you can see that when we test this with our lab strain, the albopictus males don't really have much of an effect at all 
When we look at our strain from Los Angeles, this is a strain that has been cohabiting. We see that there's a little bit of an effect on the female's fertility, but really not very much, um, especially when we compare this to the females that have been collected um, from Key West and Clovis, our naive females. So again, the data is preliminary, um, but I wanna highlight the fact that we can observe satirization in our laboratory assays, and that there certainly seem to be differences in satirization sensitivity um, between our different field collected strains. And this also means that we can make other predictions. So we would also expect that receptor variants might be different between these populations, that females from places like Key West might have receptors that are particularly sensitive to those male derived peptides compared to receptors that are cloned from populations that have satirization resistance. And this is also something that we can test in vitro. And then we can kind of carry this all the way through to start doing some genetic manipulations in mosquitoes. So we can use our CRISPR Cas9 based tools to basically mimic natural variants so that we might take this female who is behaviorally sensitive to satirization, who is expressing a gene that encodes a sensitive receptor variant and use our genome editing tools to basically do a gene swap experiment where we swap out um, the gene that encodes the sensitive variant to one that instead encodes a resistant variant of this receptor, generating a transgenic female who now expresses this resistant um, receptor. And we would predict that this transgenic female would now become behaviorally satirization resistant. So that even after exposure to an albopictus male, this female is capable of mating with an appropriate male of her own species um, and producing viable offspring. Now, one way to describe this is that you might be able to say that these females are basically developing the capability to ignore those inappropriate paternity enforcement signals from the albopictus male. But you might also make the prediction that those females could also then start to ignore the paternity enforcement signals from males of their own species. And so they may also have the capability of being promiscuous. Um, so you might predict that females that are satirization resistant are also capable of successfully mating with multiple males of their own species and producing offspring fathered by more than one male. And so these are experiments that we're also carrying out in my lab right now. And this has really important implications for vector control strategies. So there have been a number of vector control strategies that rely on the use of sterile males. And sterile males work by mating with females um, and enforcing their paternity so that the females continue to lay non-viable eggs for the rest of their lives. Um, but what this suggests is that the cohabitation history of your Egypti populations might be a really big factor in determining the success of your sterile male strategy. Because if it turns out that these satirization resistant females can also be promiscuous, those females might also just be able to remate later with fertile, ma fertile males um, really decreasing the effectiveness of the sterile control technique. And so what I want to leave you with here is one way that this might actually be developed into something that you could use in your life. Um, so you might imagine that this is a bird bath in your backyard that might be teeming with mosquito larvae that are about to develop into mature adults that can mate and blood feed from you and produce the next generation of mosquitoes. And so one of the things that we think about is finding ways to kind of weaponize these innate behaviors against the mosquitoes. So if, for example, there was a way that we could artificially activate the receptors that made the female act as if she had been mated, we could perform our own kind of chemical satirization event here. So that this female, as soon as she emerges as an adult, will act as if she's mated and produce only non-viable eggs. And this interrupts the life cycle of the mosquito. And so that's something that could ultimately reduce mosquito populations and the burden of the diseases that they spread. So with that, I wanna end and thank all of the very adventurous people who have joined my lab. I'd also like to thank our collaborators at UC Davis for providing us with field collected strains. Um, I'd also really like to thank the Beckman Foundation for funding. So this was some of the earliest funding that we received in the lab and it has made a lot of these projects possible. I'd also like to thank our other funding sources and I'm really excited to take questions at the Q&A later this week. Thank you all.